Are we roll calling? No, we're just trying to quiet the back room. <laughs> Santa's talk. Resolution 2020 109. PSC Wisconsin Energy Innovation Grant Program Facilities Assessment. Mr. Austin. Yes, I'd like, I make, make the motion. And uh, I, yeah, I did it. Way ahead of you. This is for a grant over $5,000. And I guess Wayne is in the other room and he can explain it better than I can. I, I can cover this. It's for this one, we're applying for a grant. We work through both the uh, sustainability committee, but then also through facilities and parks, just looking for opportunities uh, for us to do like what's considered an energy assessment for our facilities. Uh, Wayne actually found a, a way to do that. And the original, it was a little bit comprehensive for us to do that, but then they also now found this grant opportunity, which will help pay for the costs for doing it. So we're actually trying to, it's not been awarded yet, but we're applying for it and we're looking for authorization for to do that. Question? By voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Resolution 2020-110, authorization to retain design professional and proceed with phase one, Door County's emergency other services facility out of Washington Island Project. Mr. Austin. Yeah, we need to put the signature off and make it more there. Okay. I want to, I want to take my back. Uh, Dan's the chairman. I want him. I just wanted to get my name on there once. I said, <laughs> after you told me how it works, I was going to second the motion. Oh, okay. Dan, I'm sorry I did that. I apologize. We got her back to where we needed. Got her back to. All right. Anyway, this is uh, the hired the architect <clears throat> designed the Washington Island facility for EMS, and um, he, we interviewed a number of people, and this is the one that we have selected for Wayne and. Can you select it? One, two, three. Questions? If there are questions, we'll go to the voter board. Yeah, I'll click the button real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a general comment on something. One thing that, that I get asked a lot is I think we, as a county board, we're obviously moving forward with this, which is fantastic, but we have to get out of the stigma of calling this an EMS facility. That is shining bad light on stuff. It is a government facility, a satellite facility, a multi-purpose facility, whatever we need to do. I educate people every day that this is not an EMS facility. That, unfortunately, has taken the limelight on it. It is, but we need to get home that it's a government facility. Period. That's my two cents because it's going to haunt in us if we don't get that focus through. And the rain. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the water board. Let's pass the board 18 yes. Okay. Two absence. Thank you. This is 2020-112, acquisition of real property for public park or recreational area. Mr. Austin. Well, I think the more to do except what this is is a piece of property along the Anape River, one and a half miles south of the Forestville Dam. It's bordered on the south end of it by Kiwani County Line, and on uh, the east end, of, east side of it uh, by the Canopy Trail, and on the west side of it by the Canopy River. And this person has agreed to donate it to the county. Um, it's 100% wetlands, and their only caveat was that they wouldn't allow hunting in there. The lady that. Um, her husband's the one that donated, and she would have wished or would wish that there'd be no hunting allowed on it. And um, uh, Parks Committee agreed to accept three. 
I guess the taxes, it's not that much on the tax roll. I think it was $400 some dollars a year, if I remember correctly. And uh, so it is a huge impact on the tax levy system. How large a parcel is it, Dan? Pardon? How large, large a parcel? 43 acres, 44 acres. Correct. <laughs> This is a procedural question and concern. Uh, over the last six to nine months, I've seen this happen more and more. We have an exhibit A that is not attached, not included. Um, I really wish we would clean this up more and stop doing this so often where we have a document that doesn't have the rest of the documents included in the packet. Granted, I can go up to the facilities and park and get it, but the general public would expect exhibit A to be attached in the packet. This has been happening more and more for the last nine, six, nine months. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I applaud this acquisition. Um, it's a wonderful parcel right along the uh, existing Anape Trail um, and borders. The Anape River, uh, as noted, it's a uh, floodplain, uh, can't be built on anyway, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to protect more of the shoreline of uh, the Anape, which there's very, very little of the entire stretch of the Anape that is protected. And we have so many gems in Northern Door, um, and this the Anape River is, is definitely one of the gems of, of Southern Door, and I'm glad we're able to uh, secure some of this here, and I hope we can continue to uh, acquire more of that floodplain uh, wetland along the river. It's just south of the uh, village of Forestville, so this is land that people can enjoy. Uh, we live right in the, in the area there, too, so it's a great acquisition for Southern Door. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know if it's an answerable question, but I, I guess I, I don't know what this is wetlands. Um, we're going to create a park and right with it. Many people tromp around on the 40 acre swamp. You can't help it. I, mean, I guess I'm not saying I'm against it, but I just, it, it kind of leaves me wondering, you know, um, what, what's what's the drive behind accepting the donation other than the county having 40 acres of swamp land? Um, if it's swamp land, you can't do anything on it anyway, so it's protected more or less, right? It's wetland. So I, what, what's the intent? Well, if it's a natural area, you're still, you're still able to walk the natural area. Yep. So, and again, it depends on the water level. So at, at certain times, obviously, when the Anapi River is up, you're not going to be able to walk it. But when the uh, water levels go down, it, it would be an interesting area to walk or experience. Just in terms of a natural area, or if you're a bird watcher or those types of things, and it's right to taste it. It's made physically good. What I can do is I can... Um, <laughs> Yes, Grant, you finish? <coughs> so the <coughs> parcels in question are shown. I think it's going to go too close if I keep this up. So if you follow my cursor, uh, this is the one parcel to the south, and then here's the second parcel to the north. So it totals uh, 43 acres. And again, here's the uh, Anarchy Trail. And then right here to the south, that red line would be the line for, I guess, the county division of county tax. But again, in terms of its value, it has to be that it is low land, but if the water's down or it's still an area that you can experience and hike it, it would be a, a good area. Just in terms of have it adjacent, we could sign it. So people can still hike it. And, you know, we're not going to go through a hiking trail with it, but as a natural area, people can experience it. It can go down to the water area and stuff like that. So it's still a uh, it's a non passive use parking in my mind. Biz? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I agree with Todd. I can't I can't really see getting this land because they can't do anything with it. I guess they could walk away from not paying the taxes and we could wind up with it anyway. But we're gonna lose the four hundred plus dollars revenue every year forever. So I I really can't see uh, acquiring this land, uh, what land. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons you like to keep it is that if you keep it in its natural state. You say they can't do anything with it, they can't build on it, but they could log it off, cut it, 
And uh, this way, it remains in nature's way of keeping it. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go to the border board. <coughs> Pass on board 17 yes, two nay, two absence. Resolution 2020 113, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Pre Disaster Mitigation Grant. Joel? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to approve resolution 2020 113, FEMA, uh, Pre Disaster Mitigation Grant. Uh, what this is, is uh, Mr. King uh, is applied for a grant that I believe he said is every uh, five years we do. Um, and it's a grant you can read in there for 20, I just lost it, $20,000 and some change. Uh, the county's match is in kind, so there's nothing out of pocket coming from us. Uh, these are the grants that we keep on the books that when stuff does hit the fan in the future, by having these on file, they're able to get mitigation funds from the government. So we, Kind of got to have it in what it is. Any questions? Nothing bigger than water board. Let's pass on to 19 yes, two absence. <laughs> Resolution 2020-114, the Door County Emergency Services Strike of Medical Equipment Leasing Agreement. Joel? Thank you again. Uh, this one is uh, approval of Resolution 2020-114 for uh, equipment. What this is, as a nutshell, is all of the equipment that is inside the different ambulances and apparatuses that we currently buy on a rotating basis are now able to be leased and is actually saving the county money with yearly contracts that uh, striker will maintain, you know, there's warranty stuff. Uh, the, the biggest thing that was, you know, you look at the fiscal impact, it's a pretty hefty savings over the period of time of the lease. Um, you know, and again, you know for a fact that everything's going to be up to date because it's maintained and uh, warranty and covered all the time. So the ambulance will be fully outfitted with the same equipment over that. Questions? Dave, I go. Um, am I missing something? Did this go through finance after public safety? Does it not have to? No, it's a, it's a budgeted expense. So we have money set aside for last year and also this year. <coughs> so it, it is budgeted as far as the expense itself, but it's a five-year contract. So it's, a, it's a, more than three years. So it has to come to the county board. We do have it on the finance agenda for next week, mainly because we have finance to know that there is a fiscal change in how we'll do the budgeting. Um, for the equipment going in future years, 22 and beyond. Uh, but again, it, it is a budget that it's been. So what's the fiscal change in 22 and beyond then that I missed? This is how we're budgeting for the equipment itself. So we had started the fund where we're replacing about $75,000 um, into the fund itself. But then what we'd show is we have on certain years for equipment, we'd have to budget additional dollars. So we had minimal spikes built in. What this will do is it's going to stabilize it, but it'll be instead of the 75,000, it'll be the $148,000 that's specified as you see in the layout. Um, so the expenses in essence would be, I guess, occurring the same way, but a different way than that because it's a lease with a constant price versus a <clears throat> Money to trying to set aside and then purchasing equipment as it expires or as it's uh, needed for the next rate. And if I read this correctly, this is a five year based contract, five year based lease. Um, do we only keep equipment for five years on ambulances? It varies. I can, I'll, um, I'll wait, Aaron. Aaron, I have you. I, try, I can answer, but I'd rather have Aaron answer that one. So, Aaron, I'm going to unmute you. You can speak. Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. So to Mr. Inigal's question, the equipment we have is addressed in the 
in the memo I included, there is a set lifespan on the bulk of this equipment, and it does vary. Uh, but typically, we're seeing five years uh, before it gets to its end of life or its serviceable life, as we call it. <clears throat> so that has really driven how we view this program. And we, we constantly review this um, and work with Mr. Pavic and Mr. Whipperford to bring forward the best solution to the problem. itself it is very apparent and i don't know if steve's online as well but if you look at it even well there's, there's two disadvantages that were identified one is it takes us nine years to outfit the rigs and that was one disadvantage because when you're looking at the equipment we actually started to have equipment that's expiring before we even have the rest of the rigs out, i guess outfitted so now we're actually replacing equipment with, and also buying equipment for rigs that aren't even equipped so when we look at the numbers, I asked Aaron to go back and actually look at different options in terms of how do we work with this and what's the, I guess, the fiscal impact if you went out and actually budgeted out that entire period of time. So if you look at the model that's included, you actually did it for five years, but then actually didn't went out to 10 years. We assumed like a, I think we built in like a 15% cost of increase for renewing the contract at year five. And that's where, and when we looked at analysis and the cost figures, that's where it became very apparent that actually the lease option is, I guess, more affordable in terms of fiscal impact towards the county. And there's actually some significant savings by us pursuing this versus trying to outfit all the rigs. Now, in terms of the, like you said, the, the COTS, I know that was something that they applied for grants in the past that we were not able to get those. But again, with the lease program, now we could outfit all the rigs with those COTS. So that's something that they're, I guess, in essence, planning to do in 2021. And that's built into, I guess, the lease for right now in terms of providing that equipment. I don't know in terms of, you know, the I guess, Aaron, you can answer the questions of, in terms of the rigs, but if, if this lease would include, I guess, all the rigs, all nine of them. And then I guess the question is, as well, do they deserve to have it on the island for the number of calls that they have? I don't know, Aaron, if you have a response to that, but I guess from my standpoint, we're trying to get all the rigs on the exact same equipment, no matter who's working on those rigs, so they have the exact same stuff for all of the all of the items, so it's consistent from an emergency response standpoint. And they're all maintained, they're all under the one contract, and they're all serviced at the same time, so that was the logic behind that. I don't know, Aaron, if you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, 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 I,
No, that's that's very accurate, and I appreciate that. The to Mr. Engelbert's point about the specifically the backup truck in the island, the the reality is we move our fleets all around, and their trucks have come down here in the past. We've sent vehicles up there. Um, it's just good practice on our end to have the fleet set up the same way. To, to specifically address make Mr. Engelbert's question about the load system from a few years ago, <laughs> there was a different track we tried taking to, to get that included in the construction of new trucks that would have put us over the budgeted amount. And that's when it was logically decided not to do that at that time. And in addition, we've tried two years in a row to acquire federal grant funds for these programs, and we've been unsuccessful, unfortunately. Thank you. Laura? Uh, yeah. Just wanted to add that, yeah, this, from my understanding, all the information shared with me when I read and reviewed, and coming from a medical standpoint, um, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot of different equipment out there to keep buying new equipment gets very expensive. When you get a market that now has a lot of equipment on it, it is just better to lease and have it maintained and taken care of through the software, through the maintenance. Um, this is, uh, I think somebody made it a comment of different type of uh, ranking <laughs> um, as we went to discussion then in this committee. But I think Aaron handled it great right with the questioning too, that this is, it, it's so important to it, consistency and medical equipment. As somebody that trains people that work on equipment, or use this equipment when you're working in your employer and that equipment is changing from room to room or ambulance to ambulance, it's not healthy, it's not good, it's not good for patient outcome. So um, I, I applaud this. I'm happy to see this actually finally came forward um, as instead of keep buying new equipment. Uh, the contract is good for them. Aaron has said that it'll get made the same, it'll get updated the same, and um, I'm, I'm happy to see this and it saves us money. So. Thank you. Yeah. I want to know how much equipment are we talking monetarily and what happens to the stuff we have now? Are we selling to the piece of people we're releasing? And if we fail the lease five years from now, what would it cost us to get back into it again to have our own? Sure, I'll defer to you. Okay. So, um, when it comes to the end of five years, as addressed in the memo, we have three options. We can buy it out at market value. That That's a hard number to put it on uh, that they haven't really been able to give me a firm number, but basically they tell you what your equipment's worth at that time, you buy it out. Typically that'd be the difference of what we would owe if we were trying to technically buy it, like rent to buy, if that makes sense. Our equipment now, um, they've given us pricing on that to offset the total price of the lease. That is included in the number you see. So we're basically trading in the equipment we have. Does that answer your question, sir? Dave, I'm sorry, Aaron. Did I miss you stating what happens to the existing equipment? Yeah, so they we traded in, which... which um, we're trading it in. We would trade it in if awarded this, um, and that offsets the total overall price. But that it's already built into the price you're seeing. So the total payment is based on trading in the existing equipment we have and then installing uh, whatever the equipment is in each one of the how many ambulances we have at this moment. Yes, sir. And is it apples for apples? Um, as in, yeah, we're getting, except we're getting the newest version of the equipment that they have compared to what we have. And it will be exactly the same across every piece of equipment. Yes, sir. Thank you. And there's one thing that did come up in that discussion of the committee is obviously we rotate the rigs, you know, and what happens Do we have to rebuy the equipment or redo the lease and the way the equipment works. Obviously, if we do a remount, the remount, the uh, equipment would stay at the box. A new, a new vehicle, if we decommission one, the equipment would get moved into it. So you're not, long term of the lease, if the equipment stays with our rigs or the new rig that comes in the, in the service. Santa? 
Yes, I guess I, I still have some questions there because in this, uh, Aaron's answer about rotating the ambulances, I've always understood that if an ambulance is down on the mainland, then they move it here. It's not that they're rotated around, but he's the expert on that. Uh, talk about the software update. What if this equipment actually has some software tied to it that, that's becoming old? Uh, and that would be budgeted money. What was in the this year's budget, Ken, then for, for next year? Last year at 75000 for this account. You're saying there's enough money there to do this now? Are we using this 2021 dollar amount? And we, we've just gone through this budget process, and here we are requesting this money. I just have problems when that happens. We had set aside $75,000 this year, and then $75,000 next year. And that, those funds were, were allocated to start equipping the, the vehicles as we start going forward. So that's where the funds are for 2021 for us to start the process of doing the rates. The, again, as I mentioned before, though, if you look at the capital model, it actually, what we had anticipated if we have not, if we're not going to do the leads, and that's just what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to up our amount of money that we're setting aside into that fund because it's just not funding to the full amount. And that's why I wanted the analysis done by Aaron to actually look at that even going out that nine years. If, even, if we, even if we go off nine years, which I don't think is a good idea, but we went off nine years, we're short in terms of being able to outfit the rigs with all the equipment they need. It's going to cost us more money. So that's why we're taking this different approach and did the analysis so that if you look at it over the term of the five years they're saving depending on how it's renewed at that five-year mark there's still even more savings but you know that we're just projecting what the renewal rate would be and even within the five-year window we're actually saving dollars in terms of what our investment would be in terms of trying to do this But again, we're, we're using 75,000 for two years. And if you knew going into this year's budget that 75,000 was adequate, then that amount should have been increased uh, for the 2021 uh, budget year. And then I still have the question on software, the portion that they're saying is outdated in five years. I think when, they, when we're talking about the software updates, what they do is they, what Aaron explained at the meetings is they, they do the annual maintenance, so if something goes wrong under the lease, they'll just come in and they'll look at it, they do the thing on that. But then for each one of the other pieces of equipment, especially electronic stuff, they'll come in and they do diagnostics on equipment. And it's not really software to me, I think it's called firmware. But if there's any firmware updates and all that, uh, anything for the equipment like that, that's when all those updates are made. And those updates would be done on the entire fleet all at one time. Aaron, if I'm wrong in that, please correct me. No, sir, you are correct. And the, the firmware updates or the inspections on the units are done on a yearly basis, if not more. I, I don't know what they are in the heart monitors and stuff like that, Aaron, but I know it's done on at least a yearly basis, correct? Yeah, minimum of yearly, and they can also they they can assess the data that we are sending out to make sure it's accurate um, and catch problems very quickly, almost to the patient. Joel. Yeah, I was going to comment on that. It was the whole ambulance is basically a computer that's running everything with the hard leads, the 10, you know, the AEDs, all that stuff inside the ambulance. It's all controlled computer via the hospital, everything. So it's being ran over the, the computer system. So there's updates and modifications and changes all the time, and that's all included in the, in the package. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, I was going to ask a different question, and I found the information I was looking for. And I don't know, exhibit A, page 89. Uh, down at the bottom, it says service coverage, and I'm reading the description, and of course, they're terrible. Somebody doesn't know what the parts are, don't have a clue. But down at the bottom, it's on the service coverage model number, and it's uh, 71011 PT and 75011 PT. And both of them say no bats, which I'm presuming means no batteries. And based on the description, I'm going to guess this has something to do with the power cot, you know, about bed typing and power load. Does no bat mean no batteries? So what that what that means is um, they don't cover the replacement of a battery if it goes bad. It, they do with their heart monitors; those are covered, um, but the stretchers do not. They're 
it's very similar to a DeWalt type battery. Um, when you think of what attaches to your drill, it's just really big. Uh, so that's just something historically and in, in the years we've had the service agreements with them, they have not covered those batteries. It's the only thing they don't cover. And that's kind of understandable, but then we factor in the cost of paying for such batteries somewhere in our budget. Yes, sir. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. I guess uh, maybe a final question, unless I hear something different. Uh, are these rigs all then able to handle these costs at this time, or is that another cost involved here to update those? That's included in this as well, sir. There's modifications that have to be made to the floor and the electrical. Does four of the nine rates need to be? Floor. I'm hearing some background. Could you repeat that, please? There's four of the nine rigs need updating to operate this equipment. It would be the entire fleet, the nine, yes. He said floor, not four. He said four. I said floor. As a floor, yeah, floor. Uh, the, the, the base of the ambulance, the, the floor that we'd stand on where the cot sits on. Okay. <clears throat> Todd? Yeah, I guess not sitting on these committees, you get a little confused by um, how to place a vote on this, but if if, uh, if if this were enabled by this county board, what is the reaction um, by this department? You have to go forward and budget more in the next four or five years. Sure. Um, so just fresh out of a budgeting cycle, Okay, which which I understand Dave's concerned. Was this known? Um, I mean, were we were aware of this as we were budgeting in October, November? The, I, don't, I don't think it was full. I mean, we had the budget set up in terms of what we were trying to accomplish. I don't think we had the full model built of what the overall cost was of what it would take to outfit all the rigs over the full 10 years. And that's why I asked Aaron to do it through the budget process when we saw the issues that we started to we get to see in our budgeting. And that's why he went through the process and did the analysis on it. So I'd say the budget process actually prompted us to do the analysis that we have before you. Okay, so so an enable would force a budget overrun in this area. Well, I mean, next year we're fine, and we can start out, well, we can start operating the rigs. But in my, you know, I, I guess my thing is I don't know why we try to go down that path based off the numbers that we're seeing as far as acquisition and replacement cycle. This is not this is the way they price it in the time that we have to do the replace it, this is not cost effective but for us to do that. Again, it's this way they have the least structure, they're making the least attractive. You know, it could it be like an auto we had a discussion, is it gonna be like an automobile lease where after the five years it's not attractive? <laughs> Potentially, I don't know. We'll we'll do that analysis as it comes. You hope that when you're looking at it that you have a reasonable renewal rate. But I think that's the way we're looking at it. Do do we know of any neighboring counties or any uh, you know is there, is there, these folks must do this probably all over Wisconsin. Is there any yeah. testimonials about this being a good I don't trust there was, right? Well, I mean, this is the main company that provides us the equipment in the first place. Okay. So, I mean, from a reputability of the company itself and the equipment they have, they're very, very good. And they've been very good at their response and their service to us. So, this be a different model of how we're working with them and providing the equipment. I'll make mention of the fact that I spent. 35 years working on hospital medical equipment, buying it, maintaining it, installing it. Uh, the lease purchase option that we're talking about, probably 50% of hospitals use the lease, 50% do the purchase, and they switch back and forth every four or five years, depending upon what is most financially advantageous at the time. But this is a very day to day common practice, and the structure has been doing this. I was involved for 35 years, the structure was involved doing this. So it, it's, a, it's a very common practice. Joel? Yeah, I guess my final comment would be when how it was presented to us and you know the committee is that I mean the good analogy I guess is is the car lease. If you know every ambulance has a thirty thousand dollar witnesses car in them, they have an AED monitors and ten leads, which are all to the tunes of thousands and thousands of dollars that currently the county owns. If any one of those pieces of equipment goes down, it's currently on our dime to fix them and get them repaired in a very timely fashion on the county's tax dollars. So the way that the scene attracted to me was if we're not going to spend any budget digressing, going back to the equipment we currently own, the county plans and you know puts money in the CIP every year savings account, 
to replace that equipment as it goes forward, kind of an unknown really, because you don't know if a cot's going to last, they'd say five years, but by doing the lease now, every single piece of equipment is going to be brand new. We're going to be on a guaranteed schedule. You're going to pay the guaranteed hundred and some thousand dollars a year, and it's covered, hundred percent covered going for the course of the lease. So there's pros and cons to both things, but you know, I, I'm looking at the end line here where we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of the five years, and we know with certainty that we are going to have top-notch 100 percent equipment going into this in every angle that's going forward. So, but I understand where Dave's coming from. I totally get this question in the comments and they're valid. But I'm also relying that diligence has been done and that Aaron is pushing this and because he feels beneficial to that department. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add is that, you know, again, going through the budget process, this is kind of where it kind of, I guess, came up as an issue. And again, Aaron did a lot of hard work on this, so I appreciate his work and effort. And it, it really did this come up as an opportunity for us now to actually, again, change forward because there is a good opportunity in terms of the pricing. From my standpoint, the things that really stood out, one is long-term over the five years will save money. Uh, the second item is that instead of having the rigs, let's say if it did, if we accelerated up to five years or even stuck with the nine-year cycle for the rigs, you know, by next year, we'll have all the rigs with the same equipment versus nine-year cycle of trying to get them even consistent on equipment. And then what you're going to do is you also, like I said, if you go five years, you're going to outrig a, a, a rig now and do, and then five years from now, you're going to have different cycles of equipment on all this, on all the uh, ambulances again. Not a huge deal, but again, they're on a cycle and, and nothing's not like it's matching. So again, from those standpoints, and again, you brought up in terms of the maintenance that also now we have a known maintenance that's built into this contract. So again, there are some cons, I guess pros and cons either way, but to me, those are some pretty significant ones that I couldn't ignore, especially the fiscal side. For my my standpoint, you guys know me, I'm trying to find a way to stabilize our budget. And if I can stabilize it, for five or even 10 years, if we could redo it at a, at a reasonable rate, that's that puts us in a very good position in my mind. Anybody else? Dale, I don't know if you're still online, but we need your vote. Okay. Let us pass on a vote of 16 yay, 2 nay, and 3 absent. I could just say a quick word. I appreciate everybody's support, and I'd specifically like to thank uh, Mr. Pavick, Mr. Whipforth, um, Joanne Ballman, um, and then Karen Bailing and Grant Thomas for all their help with this project. Thank you all very much. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, the next five resolutions are all related to the same subject. I'll let Ken go ahead. Um, Sure. Okay, the best way to explain this, I mean, just take a step back because that's now we are all on the same page. I know I've talked about it a couple of times, but I just want to make sure all the same page. So, historically, yeah, I'll override that one. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Turn it up. Oh, yeah. All right, so that's what we had last night. Oh. Just, so let me just take a step back. So historically, um, a lot of communities, both counties, cities, and villages, they have what was called a revolving loan fund. Those dollars were actually federal dollars that were given to communities, and those communities were allowed to lend those out for businesses for business loans. This, the short version is that the performance of that program across the state was poor. And I say by performance, there's just a lot of cash sitting there. So what the state of Wisconsin did is they went through a process of saying we're going to close the program similar to what Illinois had did. In a, um, they actually uh, did this before Wisconsin. So in essence, when they announced that, <clears throat> what they did is they closed the program. And then, then what they say to the community is they say that you have an opportunity to 
in essence, you send that money back to the state, but the state actually holds on to it. And as long as you try to apply for a qualifying project, you can get that money back into your community without having to compete for it. Otherwise, if you did not submit a project, that money would still go back, then it goes into the state pool, and then you could technically try to apply for a project, but now it's competitive across the state in Door County, just because of our demographics and our, uh, would not, I guess, fare well through that grant process. So anyways, long story short, that was, uh, I guess, announced and we had to go through that process in terms of trying to find a qualifying project. And now uh, let's go through some steps. Our initial idea was to go through what was called the redevelopment project that was when Jim Schuster was still there at BCEDC and also the city. And we talked about working with the city on a cooperative project, if you recall, for the Westside School and also their loan program. We did a cooperative agreement with them and we actually submitted an application to the state. It was for a WIDA, with a, when I say WIDA, it's W H E D A which actually is a housing program grant application process that's competitive. And then if you get awarded that, then you can move forward. We had that all allocated towards that project. And unfortunately there's reasons behind it, but that project was not awarded. And that happened uh, last year. So I kind of put us in the bind of trying to find a project. So then there was other opportunities that we looked at. It's gone back and forth in terms of whether we have a project qualifying or not qualifying. In fact, our latest one was actually trying to work on the redevelopment of the city on their waterfront project. And again, that project initially had some promise, but what, what really kicked it out was it's considered new construction, even though it could be considered for lower moderate income housing, it would not qualify because it's considered new brick and mortar. So then the, um, we're starting to get into the timeline crunch because we have until the end of January to actually submit our project in before the funds would be, I guess, allocated to the rest of the state. So what we did is we, again, reached out one last time looking at different projects. We had ideas in terms of stuff internally they could use for parks or for transitional housing. Uh, we also were putting out feelers for other projects throughout the county. But then we did go back and we reached out to the developer to say, is there an opportunity to, I guess, work with the West Side School without any significant changes? Now, if you remember with the West Side School, that original project was to have working with the building footprint, but also a large addition for housing. And I think at that time there was 40 units they were discussing in terms of the overall development project. So what they did now is they're moving forward or proposing to move forward with that project. It'd be for right now, it's for 15 units. There might be an uh, option to add two more. They're still doing some of the initial design. I have done the preliminary designs <coughs> in your packet. But once you identify your project, and this is where kind of the time crunch came in, is you actually go to the state site and you look at page 95. There's actually a different application and a different process you got to follow for whatever you're doing for the project. So this is considered a housing project. So you have to follow the housing rules in terms of what you have to do for as a housing project. If we had done a community development project or if we did a park project or any other, there's a different application and a different set of procedures you have to follow. So once we do that, um, they are able to get the school property under contract again. And once we knew we had a project that was viable and approved by the state that put us into, I guess, what we consider fast tracking and trying to get this all lined up and done and before you today. If you go through the packet itself, it's pretty straightforward, but in essence, you'll go to page 98 of your packet, and it tells you what you have, it's almost like a checklist, it tells you all that has to be done in terms of being able to qualify to get those dollars for your project. So in essence, we're just going through this checklist and following procedures to make sure we have everything that's required for us to apply for the project. So the resolutions that you have before you today are meeting those requirements. And I'm just going to just talk about it really quick. So the first one is this a resolution that's, that you're saying that we can apply for the project and use the dollars towards that project. The second resolution is adoption of what they call a citizen participation plan. And again, what it requires is it requires us to do two meetings, one in January 
before we do the project, and then one probably about a year later when the project is near completion. One is to verify that the project is qualifying, and then the one is to verify that we actually use the dollars on the qualifying project. You know, it sounds crazy, but that's what we're required to do. So that's what that participation plan is. It's just saying we're going to get some citizens involved in terms of that, and that's the plan. Then the next resolution is actually uh, forming the committee. We're required to actually appoint the committee for that. And we have individuals appointed based off what the recommendations were in terms of committee members. So that's also included in the packet with those individuals. So that's that resolution just in terms of forming a committee and making those appointments. Then the last two, again, if you look at the checklist, are just items that have to be, I guess, on the books per se in terms of making sure that you can qualify for those dollars. So the first one is a what they call the door county. It's an anti-displacement and relocation. Again, in this project, the building is vacant, so we're not displacing or relocating anyone. So even though it does not apply, you still have to have this policy on the books. It's just a requirement to get the federal dollars. Then the additional one is what they call, uh, it's a prohibitive use and also physical barring so that's also a requirement that you at least have that on the books. So what we did is we actually did discuss this with Fanny. Grant did a lot of research. I appreciate all the work that Grant did to put this together. But in essence, it's just a, again, a required policy that we need to have on the books that was reviewed by Tammy, and she so, so supports the resolution as Grant has put it together. So again, those are the five resolutions that we would like to get passed. Um, if there's something that you're uncomfortable with, we could it gets put off, but we do have to have the full application in by the end of January. So, again, I guess our main goal for today is that we are able to get it prepared. That's why it's before you here. We think it's pretty straightforward, but if there's any types of hesitation or questions that we can't get you satisfied with, we can, I guess, postpone it to January. But our preference would be is to try to get this, I guess, some of the stuff out of the way in terms of us moving forward. So, our preference is to get it passed today. Again, in terms of the timing, it's again one of those things is where the projects we're trying to get something lined up with the most effective use of it. So I apologize if you think it's been rushed, but I've been scrambling to get a project lined up that I consider a value both to the community and the county. And I think this is a more viable project for us to do. And again, once we have that viable project identified, it's just a matter of again trying to make sure we're meeting the federal requirements that's required in the loan application itself. So once we had it, then I knew what to do, but I didn't know what to do until I had our project identified. So just trying to get some justification of why you've seen it, I guess, in this fashion. So that's a short version. Sorry about that. That's good. Todd, so quick question. Yeah, there's a lot here. Is there a, develop, is there a developer component to this? Yes. The, uh, it's a uh, Midwest Development and Duffy, the same. That's the same developer that just got awarded the project for the West Side. Mm -hmm. They were the original proposal for the project uh, when the project was not awarded, and that's why they were able to redesign the building to make it work fiscally. But again, the uh, we were just informed actually this week that they got the property back under contract and they're ready to proceed to everything fall into place. And then, uh, you clearly understand that it does not include the West Side ball field. It would be a smaller. Correct. This this is now down. What's nice about this is it kind of brings it back to my mind to a full win for everybody. So we're not touching the ball diamond anymore. So we don't have to worry about that controversy. Kind of it's just exactly on the site itself. It's working within the existing footprint of the building. There might be something that they can do, I guess, on the second floor that would allow for a little bit of a bump up for some additional units. But again, everything's self-contained. The only thing that they'd like to do is, uh, is provide parking garages. But the site's big enough to provide that without any issues in terms of that. So the city's been involved with all the needs and the discussions. So again, it has to go through their planning process as far as approvals, but it, it's not the same level of scrutiny to get the project approved or through the city. Yeah, so a couple follow-on questions if that's not procedurally inaccurate, I'm unable to do. But um part part of the whole um, um justification. Last year, year before, when we were involved in this, obviously for other committees I'm on, was it had to be that size to make financial sense and that it couldn't be done with just the West Side School and it had to engulf the ballpark. So it just kind of seems like some opposing information there. And um, let me understand, why, why is the city not doing this? Okay, so I'll take your first question. The first question is why it was not economically feasible before 
is because it was going through what's called the WIDA grant application. So for the WIDA grant application for it to be considered low and moderate income housing, and if they able to get the tax credits related to that, they have to have a certain, I guess, performa for the project cash flow. So in that case, when you're doing WIDA, they needed the additional <coughs> units to actually make that work in terms of the cash flow itself for the grant program to work. So that's why there's a change in, I guess, what I consider. So instead of going through the WIDA program, that we're not using that, we're using our, what are our grant dollars through our grant program, which still has to be used for LMI, but it doesn't have the same, I guess, review performance standards as the WIDA loan program itself. So that answers that part of the question. Then the second question was the, I guess I'm, does the city have the same opportunity to do this and why would the city, oh. city not be driving this? So the question is, is this in terms of the city? So there's two ways that we could do this. Obviously one is for us to adopt these items and then we just administer the grant. It's still, in my mind, it's still a city project in the sense that it has to go through their approval process and everything. The only difference on this one is we're administering the grant. The other option in talking with the state is we could go through the process of saying, okay, we're gonna assign our funds to the city and let them run with it and do it all, and let us wash our hands of it. Again, it's just a matter of timing and what we had done. A uh, grant was already vested probably almost a week at this time and putting all this stuff together. And it's really just a grant administration. It's still, in my mind, a city project. The city's still, gonna, I talked with Marty, he's still going to help us with all the, I guess, the steps going through the process. So for me, it's my time related to administering the grant and reporting and stuff like that. So this is a matter of who's the lead in terms of the grant application itself. So in this case, it'd be the common. Susan? Yeah, um, the county has been trying to make this work for at least a couple of years, if not longer. And I feel like Ken and Grant have been on this journey to try to figure out a way <laughs> that we don't lose these grant dollars. Because am I wrong in thinking that if we can't make this work, that 1.4 million that was sitting in our revolving loan fund is gone? Well, it's it's allocated back to the state and the ability for us to get it to the assignment of our county is very difficult. Right. So, yeah. so, so I have personally asked Ken, I don't know, every month, every other month, where he is on this, um, which as I suspect is why my name is on that list. Um, but I just, I first I want to thank Grant and Ken for, for keeping, pursuing this. It, the, the goal was, yes, to help something with housing, because that was the goal that the county had. And secondly, to keep that money in our community and not lose it um, and, and make something that's constructive out of it. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you. And just to point out, too, this behind the scenes, I mean, I've been giving updates both at um, finance, but also my, my memos to you. But we did have a team that's been working on this for that same period of time. We had DCC, DC, EDC involved. We did have the city involved. We also had human services because there are aspects for that. I had Wayne involved for multiple times. We have stuff in the community <coughs> for parks that we wanted to do, but I don't think that's the best way to use those dollars. But we did have a team of people that in Mariah was involved. So we did have a you know department heads and even some external stakeholders trying to get input, our ideas, ways to use it, what's the best way. So I, I do think it's been pretty vetted, at least working through that process to make sure we have a viable project. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the risk of being the third person to ask this in a slightly different way, um, is this unit going to be market rate, market rate or low moderate income? So what's required for the project to qualify is that 51% of the units have to be available for what they consider low or moderate income individuals. Thank so depending you. on the final number of units, it'll just have to be 51% of that. So if it's the 15, you know, it has to be eight units. If it's 17, it has to be the nine. Perfect, thank you. And that's for a period of 10 years at a minimum. Laura? Yeah, and just to speak to the county being the administrator of this application, is that if this was not going through, or if this would fall through this major project, it, one or two other options after that would be county-based. So it just made sense at this time and where we're at, we really need to be the administrator of this application. Um, so that, that being said, this has been a lot of work. 
this conversation, these discussions about this grant money um, has been happening for a long time. To get a developer, uh, housing has been a, a very strong need in our community. And uh, a lot of people asking for that better housing or low income housing. Um, to see this come forward, even when uh, <laughs> the time is, the top clock is click, clicking, as they say, uh, ticking, I mean, um, just thank you, Grant and Ken Pavick and other people um, really behind the scenes pushing this work forward and making sure it is correct and accurate. And Mariah, too, a good input. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Uh, back at page 106, the Dorf County of Dorf Citizen Participation Plan. Underneath program oversight, one per sentence, uh, second line. What is a county chief elected official? We don't usually use that term anywhere, anywhere about Sorry, can you say it again? So I wasn't on the same page. Uh, uh, underneath per program oversight, section one per sentence, per second line, it says chief elected official. So two thirds of the way into the line. Okay. Real quickly, David, that's the uh, verbiage that they use in the uh, federal regulations. In our county, the chief elected official is the county board chair. So it's the requirement, the typical requirement of using a term that they recognize as one of our representative words. Okay. Then on page 108 of the packet, subsection 4, <coughs> it references the finance committee. So yet I don't see anywhere else in the system that in the document that references the finance committee. What is the point of what they labeling them there. I, uh, when we put that together, this was, uh, again, the federal template in terms of what they do and what you have to have is you have to have the ability for, if someone wants to write a letter and identify an issue or a complaint, that one, they can file it and that uh, you identify where it's filed with, but then also to what committee it would go to in terms of if it had to go for uh, some type of resolution dispute or have it be reviewed. And again, since the finance committee has been, in my mind, the lead all the way through this program because it's those grant dollars, that's why I identify part of the committee. It just seems that my point at that time, the logical place to put it. Although well, this particular set of projects has not gone through the finance committee yet. Well, the entire program has been going through all the way through. I'll have it on, I mean, I'll have it on the agenda for next week. But again, the application for this has been, in my mind, everything's gone through finance committee as the whole committee for the, the grant dollars all the way through since we've talked about the program itself. Okay, and then the money that uh, back from when we needed to move these monies around, and this was one of the projects identified now it's more than a year ago. Um, I thought sometime in 2020 we had to make that decision. Is it's the $800,000? Is that still within our control? Is that what you're saying? I thought it got turned over to the city. Okay, there, and that's actually a very good question. So again, if I remember when I first started, there's, in our case, we have actually two loan funds. Not one was a city fund. The city had about $874,000 in their account. We have about $1.43 million in our loan program. So those are the two. What we did originally with the discussion was is that how would we work together in terms of the project and then be able to share the loan fund program so the loan fund program is actually countywide? I guess our intention will be is we're going to redo that agreement. Should this go forward now, we will have to amend that agreement with the city in terms of how we are invested with that loan fund program. And that's something that we're working on, and, and we'll have those discussions that will probably be coming. That one, we have, in my mind, we have time. We'll bring that through. The finance for review, usually the admin, oversee intergovernmental agreements, so we'll go through finance and admin, and whether it comes forward in January or February, but we'll see that move forward as an amendment. Okay, so clear, I want to make sure that was clear, that officially we don't have any money left. It is within the city, but it's a, a procedural verbiage writing thing that will have to occur because the, the other projects failed and this one is moving forward. Right, so again, there is the, there is the money that the city had, the easy way to say it is their money came in before there's rule changes, so it's considered defederalized, so they could use it as cash. They use it as cash to establish a loan fund program that's countywide as part of our agreement instead of this a city program. So that money is there and running. Our money is considered federalized, so we have to find a project that qualifies meeting the federal requirements, and that's why we're doing it this way for our, our fund. 
you know, if I can add, really what will happen is we'll need to amend the agreement to reflect what's going to happen with these funds when they're repaid. Thank you. Senator Engelbert? Yes. Uh, I guess first, as, as Dave alluded here, this resolution itself though says that it came to the Finance Committee and all this information here was at Ken's request and we do sponsor uh, Mr. Lino to come to the county board today. So the details of this uh, hasn't really been at the, at the Finance Committee. And we actually handed out an amended resolution uh, at the beginning of the meeting because we had that. Yep. Okay. I didn't look at it. Yeah. So thank you for that. Right. Yeah. And we should have told you that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the project, how you said uh, Mr. Olenija will be working with us. Who is taking the lead on this project? Should it go forward? Who's doing the the bidding and the development and, and all of that aspect it is the put it does the city be administering that project because originally that was the intent or even the economic development being the administrators of the of the funds. Again from the, from our standpoint we're the we're a grant administrator. So what you probably have if we move forward with this we'll have an agreement with the with the developer that'll probably work with grant on the book to the committee. But in essence the county is only administering the grant. We're not bidding the project. The project itself, the developer will be required to meet our requirements for the use of the federal dollars. So some of those things would be an environmental assessment that's required. So they they have that built into their budget, so they get that done by their contractor. They submit it to us as far as documentation that's completed. Another item is they have to do what's called the Davis Bacon uh, wage schedule for their workers. So they actually will do, in essence, what you do is you collect their payroll run of their hourly rates and their wages. And that's just again filed with us. And then again, that's all filed with us, and we submit that into the state as part of the grant program itself. In terms of the other construction stuff, we're not involved in that. Again, we're just the grant administrator, making sure they meet the requirements of how they use those dollars that meet uh, the requirements of the federal guideline. So we have no commitment towards this uh, potential uh, parking garage thing, or, or anything else that could be added to the project. Mm -hmm. Correct, just our 1.4 million. Well, what we'll do is I'll have, I mean, I'll have a, a, a final set of, I guess what I would consider an agreement that we would have in terms of a set of a site plan and then a site plan is going to show the design of the building number of units and, you know, might show the garages on it. The garages wouldn't qualify as far as an expense anyways, it's has to be with <laughs> the building itself. But again, we could all reference those as part of the exhibits in terms of our agreement with the, in terms of allowing them to use those dollars. No, I just want to make sure that was clarified and what Kenneth said that that would be separate because this grant money is only available to um, old construction or redoing. It cannot be new mortar and brick, as he said. So it's really important. It has to be that would be, a, I guess, a separate project. Separate project. Yep. Separate project. Any other question? I, I just one more. So you got to you got to wrap around all the stuff. So okay. When we were dealing with RLF, that was repaid loans. That was money that was reapplicated back and kept the program going. This is strictly a grant. There's no payback. Correct. This is a grant. Right. 100% grant. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do is since we have five resolutions, we'll motion each resolution individually, but we'll use the voter board uh, since this is about grants and money and spread across the five resolutions. We'll just go to the voter board for each five of them individually. We'll start with resolution 2020-115 authorization for the submission of community development grant CDBG application. Well, we need a motion. Do we have a motion? Yeah. 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 Are you in the board? Yeah, you're ahead of us. You're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. Okay. It's fine. That's passed if it's over the 17 day, one day, and three absence. Thank you. Resolution 2020 116, adoption of citizen participation plan. Thank 
motion to amend. Melissa? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. You can cancel that. <laughs> I was going to second and it went too quick. Any questions on 116? Maybe we Pass on a vote of 17 yay, one nay, and three counselors. Resolution 2021-17, approving the formation of a citizen participation committee for the community development block grant program. Any questions on that one? Vote to 17 a one a and three absence. Resolution 2020-118 Door County Residential Anti-Displacement Relocation Assistance Plan for the City PG Sal at HSG. Any questions? Passes over 17 yen, one may and three absence. Resolution 2020 119 prohibit the use of excessive force against and physically barring of entrances and exits for non violent civil rights demonstrations. Let's pass and vote to 18 yay, zero nay, and three absent. Okay. Ordinances, we have none. Special reports, diversity, equity, and inclusion, awareness to action. Okay, so let me just give a general overview, then I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. So, <clears throat> <laughs> this was kind of more of a discussion, and we're trying, I guess, to define the framework for how we are going to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion. So part of it's, uh, I guess, twofold. One is we're going to give you a little bit of a look inside of our operations, just because not everyone understands what we do in terms of our operations. But then the other part of the discussion is, well, how do we want to frame our discussions moving forward? And from our standpoint, there's three ways of looking at our discussions. One is, what are we doing internally? with our workforce and our committees. Then what are we doing with obviously the county board and maybe some of our external committees as well. And then also how are we engaged in the community as well. So what we'd like to do is have Kelly do an overview of our, our current practices and policy. And then maybe also provide just some background and some of the things we're looking at in terms of how we would move forward. And then we kind of have a discussion in terms of whether you think we're on the right path or not or how we might modify that path moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Good afternoon and thank you. So I am going to cover the areas as they apply to human resources. The equal opportunity policy is in your packet on page 116. And this is um, a policy that was adopted that provides equal employment opportunity to qualified individuals, regardless of race, age, sex, religion, handicap, national origin, or political affiliation. And discrimination on the basis of age or sex, physical disability will be prohibited, except where specific age, sex, or physical requirement constitute a bona fide occupational qualification. 
An example of that bona fide occupational qualification would be in our jail. If we have a ratio where we need female jailers, um, we would advertise specifically for that. All of our advertisements carry the acronym EOP, standing for the Equal Opportunity Employer. This policy also references Door County Code Chapter 6, which is in your packet on page 117. This chapter was adopted to oversee equal opportunity employment and service deliveries for the county. And the administrative committee was named as the affirmative action committee that was established by this chapter. This chapter covers the discrimination complaint process and provides the agencies and offices within the state of Wisconsin that people can go to to get information or file complaints. As the affirmative action officer, we ensure that all the hiring practices meet the guidelines of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Testing used has been validated, meaning that they are job related and consistent with business necessity as required by the Equal Opportunity Commission's uniform guidelines. Our employment practices, which include hiring, training, promotions, and goals are analyzed on a regular basis to ensure that we are complying and considering equal opportunity at all times. The Civil Rights Compliance Plan, which is indicated on the one page summary, is a plan that is required by the state and completed every four years and a very important piece of how we do business. Particularly, it covers the areas of health and human services and child support. That plan is overseen by the Department of Health Services and Civil Rights Compliance, work with the Department of Health <coughs> Services for contractors, grantees, subgrantees, and other providers that receive federal financial assistance through that department to ensure compliance with all federal and state laws and regulations. The plan ensures non-discrimination and service delivery, including providing access to individuals with limited English proficiency and individuals with disabilities. Door County is required by the state to keep a letter of assurance that has been approved by the state on file. Our future goals in this area include reviewing all of our current policies and bringing forward updated and new policies for adoption. I'm going to skip the section that's next and move to the continuing education section. And in this area, we have um, the scheduled internal training set for Wednesday, January 27th. And there's a brief outline in your packet on page 123 of what this training is intended to cover. So this will be for internal. I've also looked at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and they have a certificate program that would assist me in a trainer, train the trainer approach. So I enrolled in the February certificate program for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the topic areas that that program is designed to cover are on page one. And then our Wisconsin Counties Association and Aegis did provide the county board with harassment, diversity, inclusion, and workplace bullying training in September. And that's also rolled out to all of our employees as mandatory training and should be concluded by the end of this year. And I'll turn it back over to Ken and Grant to talk about the last section for presentation. Good. Okay. The, uh, I guess it's the third bulleted section in the outline uh, are speakers to make presentations and facilitate conversations. What we had taken away from, I think it's probably two county board meetings ago, that uh, the, the county board was looking to have some speakers come in and make presentations on the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, among other ones. And what we've done is identified uh, six uh, potential sources, probably more, 
First would be local organizations such as Just Door, which should be Just Door County Inc., United Way, Help with Door County, and any others anybody can think of. Uh, the three that are identified there we know have uh, active programs in this area and would likely be willing to come in and make a presentation. <coughs> We've also reached out to the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, uh, and the Privilege Institute, and made inquiries as to the availability of uh, people from those institutions or agencies to make presentations on these issues uh, to outside entities like a county board. Uh, the Wisconsin Counties Association and also NACO have some resources that we've looked at, but not explored extensively because they're not local. So when we're trying to identify our local, the Equal Justice Initiative is a uh, group that many Shomo brought to my attention, and uh, they're fairly well known nationally, and they have an active uh, presence on the web, and they uh, would, uh, and we haven't contacted them yet, but uh, they would be a resource for okay, having people make presentations. And of course, in this day and age, those presentations are going to be by Zoom or WebEx or, or remotely, not in person. Uh, and I think what we're looking for is guidance. Is what, what do you want us to do? And if any of these groups are of interest, let us know when we can pursue them further. Our focus has been on trying to get, again, a local group, somebody in Northeast Wisconsin that is accessible to us, perhaps on an ongoing basis. Is if this is something the county board or majority of the county board members wants to pursue? Uh, there you go can you hear me yes. um I, be I believe that it was after the last um the meeting with the racism as a public health crisis that i had sent out an email to um the chairman and um uh, the administrator and, and to also Supervisor Boltman about a couple of things that I had found out and 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 I wanted it sent to everyone, but it never was. So I just wanted to state that. And I had found um, <clears throat> two people. The first one, um, Arletta Allen, it, she's on the Fond du Lac City Council and she spoke on the WCA panel on diversity. And um, I thought her voice was really, really great. And she knows what it's like to run for uh, an office in Wisconsin as a black woman. And she actually does for a living speaks on topics. So that was one of the um, one of the suggestions that I had. And the other suggestion that I had, I had found um, was Dr. Alex G and he's out of Madison and he provides speaking and education on his website. And what's really cool about him is he has tons of experience in Wisconsin. Um, he was born and raised in Wisconsin. And he also has had tons of legislators on his podcast that were the first like black legislators in different offices throughout Wisconsin. So he has a ton of information specifically for um, people in government and how, and, and it would be a lot of information that, that we might not think of being an all white board and having, you know, mostly all the employees that I've seen, seen being white. So his, his name is Dr. Alex G and he's out of Madison. And um, he was re uh, just interviewed on, on um, WPR and, and a very, um, great episode about who's responsible for fixing racism in Wisconsin. So those were the two um, people that I really had, had um, wanted to suggest. I thought their voices were really, really strong and really clear. Thank you. I'll just comment. I have received multiple emails from a number of supervisors that have offer of potential um, speakers or potential resources to go by. Those are not being ignored. 
This is going to be a multi-month process. You know, what we wanted to do was start off locally and see where we're at currently as a board and then begin to expand our education and our training. And, and uh, we will be seeing and, and hearing uh, hopefully from a number of those speakers as we go on. So that none of those, if anybody has ripped me something, they're not being ignored. Uh, but we're, it's, it's going to be a multi-month process as we go through this. Laura. Hi, thank you. As I'm looking at this and just start to wonder what the cost of all of this is coming or if we are going to put a cost on this or if this is something that should be coming to finance with the amount if we're going to be putting people through continuing education, um, if we're going to be hiring speakers to come to the county to speak. I guess I would like to see um, that we before we, I guess, make a... Um, if, if we're being asked to make a decision on this today and this is coming cost to us, we should be looking at what that cost is or putting a limit on this cost because speakers can get very expensive. I guess I'd rather see a volunteer from a local, local organization or also if we are training our own department heads in something like UWGB is providing, which hits a lot of really great criteria, then I would like to maybe see a report from that department head and do a presentation for that education. I would appreciate that. And I think that hits home to us and we can apply that knowledge. So that's just my feedback and input as of right now. Um, but I'm not familiar with, with all of this and I could get more with some of these organizations, but just to start out with, I think we should be taking a cost into something of this nature and then keeping it local and uh, in our own for continuing it. That's my two cents for now. Thank you. If I could just comment, that, that is one of the things that we are trying to be cognizant of. So that's why we're trying to get some initial feedback because, again, I think the discussion is important. And, but we also do want to put a context in terms of a, a framework for a budget of what we're trying to accomplish. And again, I know there's a lot of good speakers out there. Um, and again, we could get local speakers or speakers from the state or even nationally. But I guess the I think the end is what are we what are we trying to accomplish versus let's say we can get speakers in. I think the question's got to be is what are we trying to accomplish and what do we need in terms of those speakers to help us get us there? Yes. So instead of saying we're just going to line up speaker after speaker and hear story after story, that it doesn't get us to where we're trying to go. I mean, it helps us, maybe it helps us bring more awareness. But again, what are we trying, and that's what our, our, we're trying to figure out. Is what are we trying to, when you saw the resolution, that's why it kind of slowed down a little bit. But where are we where are we trying to get or where are we trying to go in terms of what we're trying to accomplish? And then that way we can kind of go backwards and build a program to that. So there could be five of these speakers that'd be excellent, but if we can maybe get one of those speakers that accomplishes the goal, then let's do that. I don't need to bring all five of those speakers in because we only get five speakers in. So again, we're just trying to get in the context of what we think that we're trying to accomplish as an organization and just put something together to get, help us get us there. So um, Grant, if you have anything else on that part, but. I, I would just you know address specifically the task. The one region of rope presentation is five hundred and fifty dollars and the Green Bay program I think is on there is less than four hundred dollars. So that's all well within the annual budget for training. But you're correct, some of these speakers could be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, some of them may be pretty gratis. So we're, well, as Ken said, we're looking for direction, but as part of that, I should have said it when I was making my comments. It, we need to know where we want to get to so we can figure out how to, how to go there. Alexis? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the comment I want to make is that this is the, um, the legislative committee discussion was focused on this type of outreach and education for the three different levels that um, uh, Kelly provided, currently the county board and the public, um, as an outcome of passing the ordinance that have come before the board at the recommendation of the legislative committee. So as far as what the goal is, I think that the legislative committee intent was to have this board consider and talk about that ordinance and then move to doing some of this more education and outreach. That was my understanding of what the, that was my intent as a member of the legislative committee with that ordinance. Thank you. Susan? A resolution, not ordinance, apologize. So I'm going to take a stab at what we want to accomplish. Um, I imagine that 21 of us looked at this and we all had different thoughts and we had different reactions and some of us thought, wow, this is really important. We need to jump right in. And others of us thought, 
here, Northeast Wisconsin, I, you know, I, I'm sure we were all over the board. And I'm sure the community looking at this has a variety of reactions as well. I don't think there's any question that we've all watched our nation this year. And I'm not saying this stuff weren't big issues before, but I think they became crystal clear this this year with regard to all kinds of divisions in our society. And so our community has lots of questions. They want to know, they want to move forward. They want to unite. There are all kinds of these things swirling out there. <clears throat> so to the degree that we as a body represents this whole county. We are the only body that represents this whole county. And we can do a variety of things. One, we can make a contribution to the conversation. We can offer a platform for putting out information that would allow us to think, allow us to talk, allow us to recognize our differences of opinion, perhaps to come to consensus on some things. But we could have a conversation that our community could watch and also continue the conversation in their homes, in their you know, neighborhoods, wherever. Because they have written to us this summer, and there have been many with concerns. They kind of look to us because, you know, what's that organization doing? How is the county handling this stuff? So, number one, it's appropriate for us to look at how we do business and to continue to educate and evolve so that we do our, our best work and do it in the best way. But it's also valuable simply to have this information being shared and the conversation happening among the 21 of us. And then to the degree that those conversations can help us come together as a community and understand, we'll all, you know, we all read certain things, we all um, listen to certain things and they're all different. I read a book that talked about our housing policy in the United States. And one of the things I learned was that the GI Bill was not available to black soldiers coming home to get mortgages and um, educational grants. That was a shock to me. So we all may learn things. So I just think there is value in us examining ourselves as an organization and in bringing certain speakers who can help us think about it and help us have discussions about it. Um, and while I, I, I applaud the legislative committee for um, bringing that resolution forward as an impetus to this, I don't think the resolution, and I do think we should get to it, but I think the resolution is not the big issue. It's the discussion in the community and the learning and the, the process we can go through together if we're ever going to make a difference. So, for what it's worth, that's what I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really appreciate those comments, uh, Supervisor Coco, and the others as well. Um, this conversation and this effort is really important in our evolution uh, as a county, as a county board, as individuals. Um, history is not in the past and racism isn't in Alabama. Uh, you know, in 1948, a white gang of locals rounded up black migrant workers, drove them to the county line and told them to hit the road and never come back. Um, there were de facto segregation policies in this county for uh, many, many decades. Um, uh, migrant workers were, were living in segregated shanties and on average, the people with different color skin were living in the shanties that were in poor shape and with unsanitary conditions. Uh, in 1949, there were whites only signs in restaurants in Door County. There were signs that said, we cater only to whites. That was only 72 years ago. This is living memory, this is living history. Um, this process did not to point fingers, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to look inside of ourselves and find the empathy to move into the future. The, the, the goal, and this is what we really need to keep in mind, is to stay in relationship and to learn and to do better. We are building a better world so those that come next 
can struggle less and also do better. Um, I've been participating in a statewide uh, equity workshop that's been meeting by Zoom every month or so. And it's been enlightening for me, um, realizing where I've uh, used my white privilege and taken advantage of situations. And, and you know, we all have that. Um, I grew up in Green Bay. When I was a kid, if there were black people in town, they had to do something with, there was something, they were there because of the Green Bay Packers. You know, it's not my fault, it's not any of our faults that we didn't grow up in diverse community, but we do have a responsibility to recognize the implicit biases, the microaggressions, as progressive as any of us might think we are, or as open-minded as any of us might think we are. We, on a regular basis, project microaggressions and build the implicit biases in our relationships and our daily opinions about, uh, about the world and other people. Um, History is not in the past. And nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I, I applaud the opportunity for this body to dive in. And as far as that goes, you know, we've got a lot of things that we got to do in a year's time. And I know this isn't going to be the, the main focus, but uh, as much as we can do, um, you know, there there are things like the, the Harvard has an implicit bias test. Maybe we should all take it. Implicit bias test. Maybe it's not man mandated, but maybe maybe we all voluntarily, you know, take the Harvard implicit bias test. That would be a really good starting point uh, for conversation. Um, there are other. Um, sorry, I lost my note. On there's there are other uh, opportunities for. Um, oh yeah, there's there's a there's a workbook. Uh, there's a group called Crossroads. And they, they have a workbook on dismantling racism. Maybe, we, maybe we look into that and maybe we work on that. Um, I applaud the opportunity for us to have presenters and for us to not only learn, like Supervisor Cohen said, there's a lot of things about the way the world is that we don't know because they didn't teach us in school. And a lot of that was intentional, but it's also just, again, you know, we live in Northeastern Wisconsin, we're a pretty white bunch. And there's nothing wrong with that. This isn't about finger pointing. This is about staying in relationship, and learning and doing better. So I appreciate it and uh, look forward to, to more. Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has been a really interesting year for, I, I think, probably all of us. And one of the, I'll say interesting and, and I think challenging also might describe, um, describe for a lot of folks, one of the Things I'm going to end up looking back on and being really grateful for is um, that I have had the opportunity to learn more about where my um, where I fail in in my knowledge of um, other cultures and their realities, and I'm going to be really grateful for knowing where those holes were and learning um, how to, you know, be a better county board supervisor, be a better um, member of our community, uh, just by learning about the experiences of others. So, um, and that's gonna, that's something that will continue on. And I don't know if that opportunity would have arose had we not had a level of unrest um, in our communities this year. Um, so one thing I, I just want to mention, kind of piggybacking off of things my, that some of the other supervisors have said, I think it's important. Uh, some folks may ask the question of why this is important. Um, and I think it is important to, for us to realize that we all still always have so much to learn um, and our county, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this, our county is becoming more different all of the time. Um, and we, um, as this board, I believe have a responsibility to um, learn more in this, in, in this top, on this topic, uh, in order to best serve absolutely every single one of our residents. So um, I appreciate having the floor and being able to share that. And I hope everyone can uh, approach this with a very open mind. Laura? Yeah, hi, thank you. 
I'm I'm all for education. I think we want to be better. Uh, we uh, we can do better. So with that being said, I appreciate this process. It sounds like it's been changing as there's a recommendation coming through the legislative committee and now before us is some educational opportunities for the county board and perhaps the department head leaders. So I think that this is what it is, is a process. You can force people to do education through laws and regulations, but you can't force them to have those takeaways. It's their own personal process of their learning to become a better leader and how they want to be. So um, I thank you opportunity. I really like what UWGB has to offer as a continuing professional education. I think it, it lays it out, right? It, there is a goal there. There's a topic and what you're going to take away from it. And I think whatever it is that the county board decides, as part of our continuing ed that we do want to say this are like sexual harassment, maybe include part of this in that as that year going forward. Pick a topic, pick, pick the takeaways from it. Um, and I appreciate it. So whatever process comes out of this and where we're at, uh, we are as county board members allotted a certain amount of money to do for our continuing ed. I will use some of that to um, some of these topics and becoming a leader to help me. And um, I appreciate it. So I hope I hope with that, you know, we can come to consensus and, and unite more on what this direction of education that a group or some of us or all of us want to see. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one quick thing when it comes to diversity and, and inclusion. It's not a it's not a generational thing. Um, about maybe less than a year ago, I had a cousin tell my brother that he hopes ICE comes for my brother's life partner because she is a second generation American and half Syrian descent. So this cousin is about a year or two younger than me. So I, you know, I see issues with every single generation out there. And I think, you know, the talk about it'll just go away if we don't talk about it isn't realistic because it it doesn't go away. It just gets whispered more. I think talking about things like this is better to acknowledge that it's there, it exists. Now what do we do? Now how do we how do we try to stop it? Thank you. Thank you, Nessa. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question about procedure, I guess, uh, maybe for Ms. Handy. Um, you know, in our in our uh, in our policy that, that has been adopted some many years ago, um, we talk about uh, making sure that. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I'm not tracking what page it was on, but um, I believe it's in there that we have a policy that says that when we work with um, outside businesses or contractors, that we make sure that they are also following equal opportunity employment um, uh, procedures. And I'm just curious. Who, you know, where does the buck stop? Is that is that one person's responsibility in, in, in the county, in our county business structure that that makes sure of that, or is that like on all the department heads individually to make sure that that, or or is that already because it's a federal rule, it's already happening? Or, I'm just curious. I don't know if you know is that being followed or enforced, or to what degree. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a little. It's combination. Um, for any of our federal grants, they are required to meet. Um, very specific guidelines, and we have to show proof of that. Okay. Um, so it's all part of that application process. But if it's not a federal grant, is there somebody that's like, is the buck stopping at someone's desk, so to speak? The department head who's completing the grants are usually responsible for that. Thank you. There's no other questions at the moment. I guess I would. Uh, as we talked about, about, about this, Susan and I have talked about this, Grant and I have talked about this. I guess I, I would suggest, as was mentioned earlier, maybe the next thing we do is start to talk to some of the local organizations uh, that are listed here and see if they can come and speak to us or give us some information. And secondarily, go to the UWGB, another close you know, and do, let's you know do that as the next step. If that's what you're open to. Yeah, so I was just going to say, I guess what we're taking part as a takeaway, we'll, we'll put whatever path you'd like, but I guess from our standpoint, 
obviously from internally, obviously we'll we're gonna pursue our training program both far as again opportunities that we have for our employment, but also if we get the trainer trainer, that kind of thing, we'll keep on pursuing that path internally, also update our policy. So that's internally that's our path moving forward. I guess the secondary path for us will then I guess we'll work on trying to get some additional speakers. Um and I guess really what we'll do is after we get those speakers come in, I guess we can kind of do a gut check and say, okay, are we missing something yet? What other opportunities do we think we need to have in terms of discussions? But I'm not sure, again, from our standpoint, based off the comments, we're going to try to make sure we get a speaker that addresses, again, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can do that better, not only as an organization, but as a community. So I think that's what we can do in terms of training the county board, and I guess that community discussion. And then to me, the, the last part would be is how do we, I guess, engage some of those external organizations such as uh, Just Door, United Way, and do we do some type of dialogue with them? I guess that's what I perceive us for our staff trying to walk out of the truth and start working on some of those topics. If there's something that you think we're wrong on, I guess you need a time to let us know, otherwise that's, that would be our pursuit moving forward. All right. Yes, thank you. Um, specifically, I would appreciate if the discussion would be about racism as a public health crisis. I think that's really important. So yes, diversity and, and, and inclusion and, and but um, specifically racism as a public health crisis, I think, just because of the the um, Resolution that that uh, we pushed aside. I think that the way I understood it was like Alexis did, where that was a separate issue that would come first, and then the education. So if we could address that and educate um, folks on that, that would be my request. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, one more thing that I wanted to share that. I've learned by participating in this racial caucusing and, and this diversity and ec uh, equity and, and inclusivity uh, workshops that I'm taking part of. It kind of ties into, um, you know, it's our need to be educated. Uh, and we have to be uh, really conscious of the fact that we should not be relying on marginalized people to come to us and relive their traumas of living in this structurally racist society uh, and then not pay them for it. <laughs> so uh, it's really important and that's been emphasized over and over again in these workshops that I've been participating in is that it's not black people's job to come and you know tell us how to be better people. It's not Hispanic people's job to come and tell us how to be better people. It's not Asian people's job to come and tell us how to be better people. It's our responsibility to, to really, you know, to, to do that. So when we do I understand some speakers might come and maybe maybe they'll be free, um, but if, if especially, and that's been important to emphasize over and over again, especially if it is someone from a marginalized community, we better be paying them what they are worth. That's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Listening to all this, the one thing I would ask is, this is not a 24 only issue. Can we make some effort to make it more like a public making a point of making it clear to the general like a WGR announcements that we're going to have if we do these kinds of things that the general public can be aware of it and given more knowledge it's just not standard meeting that uh, we're going to make an effort to have somebody and if you're willing to sit on zoom you can possibly record it we're reviewing on the website at some other point in time Good idea. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your input. New business, not any oral committee reports. Oh, yeah, sorry. I guess I was supposed to report the last meeting that the question came up whether kayaks had to pay a launching fee, and the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Review committee minutes. Vouchers, claims, or bills. Ooh. Announcements. Our next regular county board meeting is scheduled for January 26th at 10 a.m. 
I would also like to uh, make an announcement to obviously thank everybody. We've had a difficult year this year given COVID. A lot of things that happened to our friends and neighbors, both health wise and economically. It's been a tough year for a lot of people. We still have a long ways to go. There is light at the end of the tunnel, thankfully. Uh, but I hope uh, to see you all next year. I hope you have a safe and happy holiday for you and your families. And uh, just remember, there's a lot of people hurt this time of year. But happy holidays, too. Thank you. We also have our prizes to award. Oh, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, I would love to announce first place <laughs> supervisor <laughs> of the sweater. Oh. Go like that. Who is wearing a woman's sweater? A woman's sweater. I want to have a wall now. Wait, you gotta come up. You gotta come up. This was from the women's section at Walmart. A woman's sweater. So there's a choice. You get either a chocolate bar, the hat, or you get a top hat with a mixing stick. Um, just the Second place for having the most handsomest person on his shirt. Supervisor Austin. Either hot cocoa or a chocolate bar. Either hot cocoa or chocolate bar. Hot cocoa? Chocolate bar. Chocolate bar. I think mine's more ugly. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, third place and final place, Supervisor Please Want a Chair oh, no. for an actual yeah. ugly sweater. That's <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. The Senate was just too cute, actually. Follow the law. Can you do a Broadway walk? Yeah, right. Oh, you can walk around. I keep my breath myself. Thank you. Can I share? Our meeting for the one, two, one, five. Oh, shoot. Oh, no, I got it right. Can we get more function to full price to Santa? Yeah, please. I kept like waiting for the one. I kept posting there. <laughs> you know, I'm here for my son, Mrs. Blas, and my husband, so I'm going to wish you a day, Yelsha. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank